Before we begin, I'm going to do uh, as a point of privilege to uh, Mayor Price. Uh, call it, call it uh, Mayor Price. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. I, I would like, if we could, uh, point of personal privilege to honor a great leader from the city of Newport News who passed this morning, Alan Dynastine. Um, I'd like to pray for uh, to honor his leadership and also to pray for his family. If we could have a moment, so. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay, uh, to make a, an agenda already more complicated, uh, we don't have a quorum yet, but we have uh, one or two, one or two of the cities that are supposed to be here. We'll be here shortly, and we're going to go ahead and proceed with the items that we can't proceed with, uh, and then we'll kind of bounce around a little bit with that. So, uh, TPO, I'm calling TPO to order, and I'd like to call the H Tech Board to order. Okay, uh, for the TPO, uh, I need, let's see if we can do the agenda. Can't do that, okay, well, we're, we're, okay, we're gonna jump right to the public comment period. Um, I have no one from the TPO signed up to speak. And I do have um, Mark Gadoldi to speak. Okay, Good morning, uh, chairs and honorable commissioners of the two bodies. Uh, my purpose in speaking to you this morning is to ask for consideration of an addition to your legislative packet. I spoke a month ago regarding the destruction of trees as part of the major building program for transportation that we have going on in the region and ask that consideration be given to replacing the trees that have been removed. As you all are aware, we are in a very challenging period with regard to climate, greenhouse gas emissions, and the repercussions of those changes and trees are part of the natural system for removing greenhouse gases and mitigating the effects of climate change. So since you have before you consideration of legislative packet, I would ask that you request of the General Assembly that they do two things. First, they establish a policy that when trees are removed for transportation reasons, that there be a replacement. And second, that they would allocate money to facilitate this policy change. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have one. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we'll jump back to the TPO. Approval of the agenda. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? We'll move over to the H TAC approval of the agenda. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? <laughs> At this time, the um, HERTAC board will stand at ease. Okay, for the uh, TPO. Uh, right now, we'll call on the executive director's uh, report. Thank you, Mr. Shepard. Uh, Chair Shepard, included in our agenda package for the HRTPO board is my monthly uh, executive director's report. Um, in order to uh, allow enough time for the board's conversation today, I'll keep my report brief and just uh, see if there are any questions regarding the information I provided this morning. Any questions? Okay, uh, now we're going to move to the election of uh, the TPO officers, and uh, and I'll call Mayor Alexander. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Would you like me to 
TPO nominee committee was tasked with bringing the slate of officers to the board for consideration to serve for the next year. Nominee committee hereby submits following individuals for consideration. Chair, we are John Rowe, City of Horseman. Vice Chair, we are Donnie Tuck, City of Hampton. Secretary, Bob Crum, TPO Executive Director. This concludes my report. Okay, great. Thank you very much for the list. Um, Procedurally, um, question, do we proceed with a uh, with the chair vote first and then the vice chair, or do we do them all in? We, we can do this and that, we're saying. Okay. Um, so you, the nomination made from the committee, um, just heard Rick, is there anyone else or anyone that would like to submit their name that was not submitted for consideration? Seeing none, I will close the uh, nominations. Um, I guess we'll proceed to the, the committee vote. Okay. Um, I need a motion to accept the committee's report. We do not need a second to move the committee. Okay, so moved, okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None opposed, so the, the, the committee and uh, Mayor Rowe has been duly elected as the new chair. Um, before I hand over the, the gavel of power, um, <laughs> I want to you guys share this. I feel like four here. Uh, I wanted to, I wanted to uh, take a few moments. Um, there are two things. Uh, it's been a, just a tremendous honor and a privilege to serve as chair of the TPO. Um, and there's two things that, just, just the two things that we'll talk about, there are millions of things that I've witnessed and saw over the years. Um, what truly amazes me is that we continue to make in incremental steps towards reaching uh, the desired goal. Of course, the goal's gonna change and we're gonna continue to make those incremental steps, but we are doing that. And if you just think 10 short years ago, or about, we're doing things today that we didn't think were, were ever going to happen. We're seeing roads improvements, transportation improvements that we didn't think we'd ever see in our lifetime. Um, and to make this happen, we had to overcome a lot of hurdles. We needed state support, which we've, we've, we've gotten. Um, we had to come to get all our, our uh, various municipalities to agree on prioritizations and funding. And I talked to executive, one of the executive directors, I'm not going to say who, but uh, I said, why is this getting so hard to do? I mean, it's, it seemed like we were really rolling quick, and then it started getting really, really hard to do, the trestles and stuff like that, the tunnels and there. And it was, uh, the comment was really uh, kind of, just kind of hit the nail on the head. We picked the low hanging fruit already. So now it's getting hard. It's getting hard because we're saying we're, we're, we're dealing with the money issues. We're dealing with planning for the next next roll around. <coughs> and the other thing, though, that was that's I think is really amazing, and I'm really really proud of, is that you guys are the ones that are making it all happen. You're making it happen, and there's and it's just an honor to work with you because if we don't pull together and continue to pull together, row in the same direction, this would not happen. It would, there, there are forces external to us that would more than likely be very glad to pull this whole thing apart. And we could be back to square one, or pretty close to square one. So the fact that, that all these municipalities have been able to do that and get and, and accomplish as much as we have has just been a tremendous honor and privilege. So, um, I want to thank you very much for having that opportunity. Um, I look forward to working with the TPO and HR tax. I'm not going anywhere. And uh, I don't doubt take the power. Transporting sort of that direction. Um, we have, I think we'll get a picture. We've got to do a picture here. So, so if I may, first off, um, Chair Shepard, it's been an honor to be here so appreciate the hard work you put into this organization, into our region. Um, we didn't think it was appropriate to do give you yet another resolution. So staff's working on something for you for next month. 
Uh, but to finish that job, we would like to get a picture of you and the incoming TPO chair. Uh, Joe Turner is going to do that for you. So if you would, um, if you could be patient just a moment, I, I would appreciate. And then we'll be back for a presentation that will be a little different next month for, for our outgoing chair. I believe he's sitting behind me. Uh, so no faces, Mike. But Mike Kimball. 
Mike, 30 years of HR TPO. Uh, so, um, you know, he, he told me a story once, and Mr. Shepard, I think you will know, relate to this. You know, Mike Farmer hired Mike Kimbrell as an intern uh, at the TPO. That's how he started his career. And has gradually worked his way up. And uh, he's told me a lot of stories on how much he learned from Dwight over the years, and then Camellia. Um, Mike was doing John's job managing our transportation improvement and our financial processes through the TPO for a, a long time. I think there was even a time where he managed the IT network in-house. Worked his way up, just a really dedicated employee, and we were really excited uh, when, when Dr. Robinbach retired, Mike was promoted into the Deputy Executive Director position at the HR TPO. Um, I rely on him more than I can even say. He's the guy that day to day really makes this TPO do what they do and, and operate effectively and smoothly. Um, Mike's uh, the ultimate professional, um, and I, I can't say enough about what he contributes to our organization. So, Mike, thank you for everything. Mr. Chairman, that concludes uh, my report. Thank you, Bob. And we do indeed have a great stand. Uh, we come now to item 6E, which is the consideration of the 2020 Regional Legislative Agenda file. <clears throat> so Mayor Rowe and HR TPO board members, I present to you today our proposed legislative agenda uh, for the 2020 legislative session. Uh, this legislative agenda you uh, have presented to you as a proposal at your July HRTPO board meeting. Uh, Mike Kimbrell and I, as we put together these ideas, we uh, considered the input we received at that meeting, as, as well as conversations that have happened around the region about important uh, transportation issues related to our legislative program. So what I'd like to do is run through this for you and outline the proposed items that we would ask for you to endorse. Uh, the first item is to continue to pursue federal and state funding for the I-64 Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel expansion project. Um, I, I know it's not news to anybody in the room, but this is the largest transportation project in the history of Virginia at $3.8 billion. And through the leadership of this board, of our local elected officials and of our general assembly members, uh, this project is predominantly funded by HR TAP. We're fortunate that we have $200 million of smart scale money in the project, but by and large, $3.6 billion of this $3.8 billion project is currently funded or financed in some way through the HR TAP funding mechanism. Obviously, this project is critical not only to our military and national security, not only to our port and the nation's East Coast economy, and to emergency evacuation and state tourism uh, industry. Uh, we would ask that the TPO endorse uh, our efforts to continue to pursue federal and state dollars to apply to this project. Um, work closely with Director Page. Know that HR TAC and the TPO have many other needs and you know them very well. Fort Eustis Interchange, uh, the 464 64 Interchange, uh, the continuation of I-64 improvements on the peninsula, uh, future phases of 264-64, Northampton Boulevard or Independence Boulevard. Every dollar from outside our region we can bring to the HRBT project frees money up for HR TAP and PPO to work to redirect to another project. So we believe this is an important item for us to, to keep on our legislative aspects. Secondly, uh, we request that the Commonwealth place priority on the widening of the nine mile section of I-64 from exit 234, that's Route 199 in Lightfoot area, to the James City County and UK County line. Uh, I, I know that you received a request uh, from our peninsula localities and this TPO board endorsed uh, a resolution in um, July asking that the Commonwealth place priority on this segment of road. Uh, simply put, we are widening uh, with our HR TAP monies uh, three segments of I-64 takes you just west of Williamsburg and I know this board uh, feels very strongly that we want to finish that job, take that to our line and even hope that the Commonwealth can play a lead role in helping complete those improvements as you move further westward to the Bottoms Bridge Road uh, intersection on this side of 295 New Richmond. 
the next item is to support increased funding to the Virginia Smart Scale Program. Uh, first off, I, I need to pause um, and, and say that Commissioner Stephen Bridge, uh, Deputy Secretary Donahue, um, thank you for the state's support for our region on Smart Scale. Um, I'm not ashamed to say that we believe we've done very well with Smart Scale in the statewide competitive uh, pot. And what we appreciate about that is it's technically driven. Uh, we've been putting in good projects that show congestion relief, and Smart Scale has shown that we're ranking very well. And I think we've had some of the highest ranked projects in the Commonwealth. So uh, we've been able to bring some Smart Scale money to HRBT, as I mentioned. We've been able to bring some to the High Rise Bridge 64 Southside project. Um, we've been able to bring some to the 264 64 interchange. The challenge is that when we're dealing with these large mega projects, there's just not enough money in the smart scale process. We would like to see VDOT get more money for the smart scale program. And just to give you an idea, um, HR tax financing over $5 billion of interstate transportation improvements in Hampton Roads. The last statewide fund competitive pool had about $450 million available in it statewide. We took half of that, almost half at 200 million, right? So there's just not enough resources for VDOT to meet their statewide needs, and certainly from our region's perspective, for us to be able to get smart scale money for our needs. So we would encourage the General Assembly, we know it's very difficult funding decisions, um, but if there's any way to uh, increase the amount of funding in the smart scale program, we think that would be beneficial to our region and the entire Commonwealth. We also want to continue our efforts to promote higher speed passenger rail service between Hampton Roads and Richmond, uh, including projects of independent utility that improve travel times and reliability for both the south side and the peninsula. Uh, we've run into some difficulties getting the phase two environmental studies complete, so we reworked our strategy. If there are projects that help reduce time of travel, We'd like to work with the Commonwealth to get after those projects, see if we can't get some of those projects complete. Uh, Mike Kimbrell and I are willing to open up and look at what we're doing with our TTAP to see what monies our TPO might be able to bring at these projects. But we really think that every step we can make to improve the competitiveness of passenger rail between our region and Richmond is going to be a benefit to our, our, our region's economy. So that um, represents, uh, Chair Rowe, our um, le proposed legislative agenda uh, for the upcoming session. Um, I would ask um, that the TPO board consider taking action to approve uh, the legislative agenda. I did, however, want to pause and refer, and I wanted to thank uh, Mr. Gold Gutrowski for his public comment on our TPO legislative agenda. Um, I do want to note that your companion organization, the HRPDC, is going to consider on their agenda a statement about the importance of programs to encourage and support localities in tree planting and in um, uh, forest uh, preservation and restoration. So I, I did want to mention that that, uh, that item will be addressed in the HRPDC legislative agenda. Uh, Mayor Rowe, with that, I'd be happy to respond to any questions. If there are no questions, I, I would ask for approval of our legislative agenda by the TPO. Thank you, Bob. You've heard the recommendation of our executive director, Bob Crum, so that we can get this matter before us for consideration and discussion is our motion to uh, approve Bob's recommendation. Okay. And the so moved. Second. The motion has been made and duly seconded. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, ready for the question. On favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. And that motion carries. Which brings us to item 6F, the consideration of the approval of the consent agenda. Bob. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Rowe. And included in our agenda package is a list of consent agenda items for which we asked for the TPO board's uh, approval today. Uh, what you will see is many of these items um, represent the work of Mr. Mahaley of get, queuing up your uh, TIP amendments, your Transportation Improvement Program amendments, so that they may keep projects moving forward uh, on task and on time. 
Um, other than that, I, I don't believe there's anything that requires discussion, um, Mayor Rowe, unless there are any items that board members would like to uh, pull from the consent agenda. With that, I would recommend that the TPO consider taking action to approve our consent agenda. So thank, thank you, Bob. So we, for, we have a motion to approve the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion on the motion? Ready for the question. All in favor of the motion, please vote aye. 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 Vote nay. Hello. Is there a nay? <laughs> then the motion carries. And that brings us to item seven, which is uh, the TPO will stand at ease. At this time, I'll call the HERTAC board back to the order. And I just wanted to start briefly, um, I don't have a lot of comments, but I want to thank everyone for being here today. This joint meeting is very important to us. And I think as we have these concurrent meetings, it gives us the ability, and in my 19, almost 20 years of public service, I found that the more we hear together, and we all hear the same, the update at the same time, <coughs> the more we can have a feeling of understanding between us. So I think it's a very, very valuable thing. And we all know to keep our eye on the prize that we are looking for December, hopefully to have a master telling agreement before you. So that is the ultimate goal of what we're doing here today. So I'm not going to waste any time. We have a very important update coming. So I'll turn to Executive Director Page to go through the consent items briefly. Thank you, uh, Chair Johnson. Uh, before you, the consent items, minutes of the September 19th meeting, amendment to the approved HR Tech 2020 HR Tech Administrative Project and Development Budget, an amendment to the HR Tech Accounting Policies and Procedures. The decision briefs are before you in your packet, and uh, Madam Chair, I'll turn it back over to you for the, uh, for the motion. Thank you. Do I have a motion on the consent agenda? Motion for approval. Second. I have a motion and a second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you very much. Um, I will mention before we get to item six that the information items number seven, the time allowing, we may get back to those, otherwise it's going to be reading material at the end of the meeting. So with that, um, I'll turn to Jim Rose. Thank you. The TPO is back in order, back in session, and we're now uh, at item 10 of my agenda, which is the Regional Express Plans update. Uh, Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So just to recap, uh, the TPO board um, will recall, and HR TAP members as well, that last month, uh, Director Page and I worked to have a concurrent meeting between the HR TAP and the HR TPO uh, to have a con beginning conversation or continued conversation on the proposed regional express lanes network. Uh, this was follow-up from our July board meeting and you'll recall in July, uh, just to recap for everybody, uh, the board asked the TPO staff to work with VDOT to analyze uh, how the Express Lanes Network would work in, in, in two steps. First, for VDOT to analyze how the Express Lanes Network would operate in, on the opening year of 2025. But for the TPO staff to look further in, in, in the future, to look out to 2040 and 2045 and do an estimate of how the express lanes network would work in comparison to the general, if we went all general purpose lanes. And what we found uh, with our modeling analysis was that if we built all general purpose lanes, uh, we were going to see high levels of failure when we got out in 2045. What our estimates showed were that we can expect when we get out to 2040 to 2045 about 20% more traffic going through the HRDT. Uh, that with continued growth, um, we were going to have continued uh, congestion increase along that corridor if we went on general purpose. And really finding that we're really constrained in two important ways. Number one, there's not a whole lot of right away there, right? That you're really constrained as you come down the peninsula through that Hampton segment. Uh, through very important properties that you can't expand any further. When you go to the south side of Norfolk and the Willsby Spit impacts and the impact on the military, we have to train there that we really have to make the best use of the lanes that we can build. And what our analysis showed was that if we went with express lanes, the performance of those express lanes was very good. If we got out to 2040 and 2045, that we could guarantee a trip around our um, managed lane system through these new regional 
transportation investments that really provided the best chance of really good mobility for, for, for our residents uh, and, and for our visitors. So where we left it last month was that VDOT would come back to us today and, and give us an overview of what some of those additional improvements would, would look like and what the cost would be associated with those improvements. Um, Mayor Rowe um, is chair of the TPO, Mayor Johnson is chair of HR TAC. We have Commissioner Bridge here today to give that briefing. Um, I might ask if Director Page has anything to add to any of my comments before he <coughs> does that. If I, if I may, uh, Chair Johnson and members of HR Tech and TPA, thank you for the floor. Uh, I think the uh, reflecting back, and I was having a conversation with uh, Deputy Secretary Donahue last night, and it was it was pretty forthright. Look where we were five months ago in the discussion of the Express Network and, and where we are today and moving forward with this. Mm -hmm. Chair Johnson, I do agree with you. I think December 12th's meeting will be monumental for us with that master total agreement. I believe that uh, those that represent the Secretary of Transportation and also the, the Commissioner being here as well, representing VDOT, uh, we're all championing to that finish line, which is that agreement date of December the 12th. Um, as we move forward with that, I think that uh, it was very important that the uh, TPO and HR TAC have a smaller committee, which they did uh, sit uh, together. Uh, to come forward today with some comments that will conclude uh, uh, following uh, Commissioner Bridges' presentation. I think it's a, a, a lot of courage has gone into this and also the forward thinking of where you all have been around this table for the last 20 years and then how fast we're going to get forward to realize the vision that you want and we're going to deliver it for you within the next five years. So turn the floor back over to uh, the two chairs, uh, the TPO and HR TAC respectively, to, to move forward with the agenda. Thank you for the comments. We'll have our commissioner come forward. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. So back in September, as noted, I had presented a proposed uh, regional network of seamless uh, express lanes extending from the Jefferson Avenue area all the way through the HRBT 64 all the way around the high-rise bridge and down at Bowers Hill. And at that point in time, I had indicated that I'd be back today to be able to brief the board on the projected project costs uh, that were associated with uh, those proposed improvements with, that, with the, that scenario, as well as the traffic and revenue forecast projections that we have. So. I'm going to start off with the project costs. I will say that uh, the traffic and revenue, we do have a couple slides at the back to be able to give you an update on where we are with that. So just as a refresher, uh, let me just preface that the project costs that I'm going to talk about today are not inclusive of the high-rise bridge or the improvements that are already being made as part of the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel expansion. <coughs> the private costs today are those private, those costs that are that would allow us to create this 45 mile net, seamless network of express lanes that were in addition to those two projects. Um, predominantly, I'll, I'll break it up into two segments, those that are contained on the peninsula side and then those that would be impactful on the south side. So I'll start with, again, as I start the, the regional network coming out of Jefferson, uh, Jefferson Avenue all the way down to uh, Mercury into the, uh, the settler's landing area. If you recall, last, last month I had proposed, or we had proposed re repurposing the existing HOV lane from Jefferson all the way down to the Mercury Boulevard interchange. Uh, that's that schematic that you see on the top left hand side uh, that just simply remove, repurposes that HOV facility, creates a bollard separated uh, lane, that entire length, with some ingress and egress points along, along the roadway. Uh, as we get down to the Mercury LaSalle area, we do open that up as we get closer to the, the 664 interchange. Again, it's converting that HOV2 facility to a HOT2 facility, one managed lane. 
The other item that we had proposed would be now creating a two by two network, as I indicated last month, uh, creating two managed lanes in and around the vicinity of LaSalle, Riprap Road, and then two general purpose lanes that would feed into eastbound uh, tunnels of the HRBT. Uh, this would in, include some widening efforts that we anticipate that would start around the Rift Wrap Road area uh, to be able to create that, that network, uh, that two by two entrance portal. So what are those key elements that, that we're talking about, the cost that would be associated with those, those, those two improvements? One, the repurposing the HOV lane to the hot, well, we already have the pavement width, the, the, what I call the real estate already in place. It would really be the installation of toll gantries or toll equipment, signing, marking, and the post-mounted bollards that you would see just to be able to provide that separation. Again, most of the real estate is there in both directions, eastbound and westbound between Jefferson and, and, and Mercury, so there, there's not that sizable cost other than those, those couple items. The major cost to be able to create this two by two network is really in the widening efforts associated with creating this two by two uh, entrance portal in and around the LaSalle Rip Rap Road area. You can see up here that we think in the eastbound direction, we have a number of improvements for a number of ramps that would be associated with the project, as well as uh, some bridge rehabilitations and some replacements. I, I'm going to say right now, this is worst case scenario for the cost that I'm going to sh share with you. We have concept level plans right now. These are not detailed engineering diagrams. We've been solely focused on trying to identify what a regional network would look like and how it would function. And I think we came to that point last month. Now that we have this, we're, we're churning through the engineering side of the house to say what is truly needed. So when I say that we may need a replacement of a structure, this is our worst case scenario. We might be in a position where we can rehabilitate it or look for some of these that can be rehabilitated. Maybe we don't, don't even need to touch it. Maybe there's some restructuring efforts that are gonna be needed. But we are, I, I just wanna stress, we're at a very early stage in where we are, so the numbers that I'm going to present are, again, our worst-case scenario. Uh, in this case, we do have a number of loop ramps, uh, most notably at the LaSalle uh, location that we would need to realign and re replace potentially some bridges. Uh, this, again, is the realignment as we create some shifts as we come through the 664 interchange heading in the eastbound direction. Uh, we do know that, or we think at this point in time, our major cost associated with this rehabilitation, one is the widening effort, but also, two, the replacement of the uh, Hampton River bridges. Those bridges were built in the late 1950s, I believe 1957 or 1959, were the original structures in place. Uh, we're looking at potentially needing to replace those simply because one, they're going to meet their end of their useful life. Two, they are a fracture critical bridge, which means that if one of the members fail, the, the, the entire bridge fails, we want to take that out of, potentially out of the system. Our preliminary assessment would su suggest that a rehabilitation of that structure versus a replacement, the delta in that is only $20 million. So with that being said, I, I think we're gonna to lean towards that, but again, the engineering judgment or the engineering analyses need to be done. In the case of uh, any widening and capacity improvements that we're gonna be putting along the corridor, we're gonna to need to be looking at conducting a sound wall uh, analysis. Uh, so the estimates that we have today are assuming that we will have sound walls starting in and around the vicinity of uh, Rip Rap Road all the way to the uh, um, Settlers Landing location. That will mean that we will likely need some right of way on the eastbound side to be able to accommodate that. Uh, one item that is not noted up here is that the inside shoulder, that closest to the existing median barrier, uh, we will need to rehabilitate that 
that uh, pavement shoulder width to something that can carry full depth, another, that can carry full uh, traffic loading on it. Uh, and in doing so, we're going to need to look at the drainage patterns in there. Right now, when it rains, there's enough width for the, the shoulder to handle the rain, that, the water that falls. But as we constrict that, that shoulder width, we're going to need to have additional drainage along the corridor. So one of the major items that you do not see up there is going to be a drainage item. So in the westbound direction, uh, we also have a number of improvements that, that we're proposing in some uh, ramp realignments, uh, replacements of the King Street Bridge. Uh, we do feel at this point in time, based upon the proposed maintenance of traffic requirements associated with the replacement or rehabilitation of the eastbound Hampton River Bridge, that we will need to widen the westbound bridge just to be able to accommodate the volume of traffic at that location. Again, this is very high level preliminary analyses, uh, but we would see that there would be probably some meeting of uh, the widening of the Anchor River Bridge. Noise walls will need to also be evaluated, as I said, and if noise walls are uh, required, then we will be looking at some nominal right away that we would need to procure at that point in time. Uh, at this time, I'm going to say that there are some opportunities that we still need to evaluate to reduce these costs along the eastbound and westbound side. And what I mean by that is we focused on creating a two by two network. Uh, right now, under the proposed scenario, we would have that two by two, that second lane entrance occurring in and around Rip Rap Road. But I think there may be an opportunity that we could look at, can we have that second entrance closer to Settler's Landing and potentially avoid this location, uh, this, the replacement of these bridges? I don't know that. This is a question that, that was raised uh, yesterday at the Commonwealth Transportation Board meeting. I think it does have some value and merit for us to evaluate that. Uh, so I would I want to take this back, I was talking to Mr. Hall here earlier, just to be able to make sure that we have a set of scenarios to bring back to the region. If it does work, and there may be that opportunity that we could forego a, about a $300 million investment in the eastbound direction just by shifting, tinkering with that, uh, that entrance. The second item that we want to evaluate is whether or not the westbound uh, direction needs full two two hot lanes or two managed lanes in the westbound direction after Settler's Landing. Is there an opportunity in there? I don't have those figures right now, but the, these are some of the questions that have been asked. I think they have merit and certainly bring that back. But uh, what you see here for six hundred and six hundred fifty million dollars is creates the full network that I have presented, at least on the Hampton side, the full network to be able to accommodate a two by two network in both the eastbound and westbound direction. Uh, all the toll equipment, the signing, as, as well as the preliminary engineering, the, the right away costs, utility relocations, if there are any, and the, the contingencies that we have at this stage of time. Uh, since it is conceptual level at this, this point in time, our contingencies are relatively high. I will say that they're in line with industry standards, but as we would do the engineering evaluation, those numbers will come down. So let me go, if there aren't any questions on the peninsula, I'll go to the south side uh, where we have. We do have a question. Thank you, Pastor. Well, I, I was going to read action to its form. Um, and, and we had this discussion last Friday at our subcommittee meeting. And one of the thoughts was, in fact, if you were going to need four or two by two coming out of the tunnel and going up. But at the same time, though, right now you have um, two lanes coming across the bridge and it picks up a third lane after you get through the Mallard exit, which is I think about 268. Then you got four lanes coming out going into two. Or well, four lanes coming out going into three. You're going to create a bottleneck coming out of the tunnel. Um, and maybe you'll adjust on the bridge. I'm not sure where you'll adjust. But 
but um, that's a consideration. And secondly, if you're going to do a two by two, you will also have to consider the golf course that you're going to be off the course to that golf course. And I don't know if you thought about that. Um, I've been focused on eastbound. I have to think about westbound in previous conversations. So that's something out there for you. Mr. Chairman, Mayor, I, I completely agree. This is all within the last 12 to 24 hours of the conversation that was had. Um, we do have a number of pinch points, especially on the peninsula side, the Veterans Cemetery, Hampton University, and certainly recognition of the golf course there. All very important factors that we need to take into consideration at, at this concept level. I share with you some of the concerns that the last thing we want to do I think we've done very good over the last five months in looking at how we clear the bottlenecks in the eastbound direction by creating a two by two network. Your concerns are very similar to those of myself and others in fields that say, are we going to create a similar bottleneck departing and leaving the tunnel? And that's certainly not what we want to do. We know that the proposed scenario right now works in creating that two by two network throughout the region. Um, so I think that is our base network to work with, and if we continue to work with that base network, we're looking at 600 to $650 million in investments solely on the Hampton side of the water, or on the peninsula side. And, and then I guess another comment would be, um, I'm not so sure if, I understand the concept of the sound walls, perhaps increased volume of traffic, but if you're putting sound walls up from roughly um, LaSalle or Rip Rap, to wherever, whether it's down by Seven Dragon Bridge or whatever, you for the most part will block the view of our city. You've got a pretty attractive city. I'm not so sure if you really want to do that. So that might be something to back into your consideration. Mayor, what I'd say is that there may be some unique opportunities to use some innovative sound walls that are transparent in that that we can evaluate that. Uh, as I'm reminded from our environmental staff, and believe me, I've asked why in the world we need to put sound walls up along certain corridors and, and challenging policy. We do have some federal requirements that we're still going to need to work through. Again, this is all preliminary. We have not done a sound, sound analysis associated with it, but if need be, I think those are some unique opportunities that we would have one, to comply with federal law, but also the opportunity to be able to make sure that no blockage in the city would be taken into consideration. Right. So it, moving forward to the south side, just recognize that we really have that stretch between I-564 and 264 where we were looking to continue to maintain the hot two uh, reversible network in the median uh, and as well as add uh, hot to part-time shoulder lanes in the reverse direction uh, along this entire stretch and, and what you can what we've shown here again is that typical section of an AM peak period uh, and a PMP period where if we have traffic moving in the reversible lanes in the westbound direction in the AM uh, we would have the part-time shoulder lane in the eastbound direction, vice versa in the PM. Uh, one other item that we did note in, during the proposed scenario last month was creating a slip lane uh, roughly around the Tidewater Drive area and 564 interchange to be able to create that, uh, that two by two network as we've created on the peninsula side on the Norfolk side. So what, is, what's, what are these items that are included? Uh, by and large, it's simply repurposing the existing pavement that we have there. We are going to have to reconstruct the shoulders in this case, very similar to what I said on the peninsula side. As we reduce that shoulder width, we're going to have to en enhance the drainage system uh, up against the median barrier. We do have signing and marking. Uh, we do feel at this point in time that we are constricted at Tidewater Drive and Chesapeake. We will need to widen those structures out in both directions to be able to accommodate part-time shoulder lane. And again, we're going to need to evaluate the potential for sound walls along the corridor. Uh, as I mentioned before, the creation of that slip ramp at the 564 interchange. Uh, and again, 
very similar order of magnitude cost as we're seeing at this concept level. Uh, the, the, the Norfolk side or the south side is about 170 to 185 million uh, in proposed improvements. There are no questions with that. I can move on to our traffic and revenue forecast. Um, and I'm going to stand before you and say that uh, we have pushed extremely hard to be able to get a the modeling analysis done to identify what a proposed network of express lanes would be. And our focus has been getting to that point. Um, we've been working with our traffic and revenue team to be able to generate those numbers for you. And I'll say that in reviewing the scenarios and the results, we did not have full faith and confidence that we would be giving you the, the correct numbers today. Um, we have pushed as hard as we can, and ultimately the responsibility for us to deliver to you today, we did not make it. But over the last five months, I think we've worked, we've gained a lot of confidence in being transparent in what we've provided you to be able to make sure it's accurate, and I could not guarantee you that standing before you today, those numbers would be accurate. I apologize for that, um, but I, we, will, we are making strides continue to make strides and we should have that information for the November meeting. Uh, if there is a November meeting, but certainly before the December 12th uh, master calling agreement. Uh, having said that, I do want to tell you, give you a quick overview of what we are analyzing rather than saying we don't have any results for you. We are looking, as I said last time, we were, we're very interested in understanding the hours of operation. So are we going to have a 24-7, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, hot two network? Or are we going to have a network that's 24-7, uh, hot three? And we can also look at that same set of scenarios, or are we going to have it only during the peak periods? And again, if we do a peak period tolling, our recommendation is no less than four hours of the peak period. So we would also be looking at a hot two and a hot three during the peak period analysis. One thing that we did here, and I think this dates back all the way to December of 2018 when we started the operational analysis, is we recognize that this is an opportunity, at least through the, the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel, that we have a significant base of travel that would be in excess of our HOV requirements, hot two. So do we want to take a look at tolling on our weekend? We'll already be doing it in a 24-7 environment, but do we want to also look at what the impact of a weekend hot uh, toll is going to be, or be in a position where everyone that crosses that uses the express lanes is tolled? So in other words, there is no HOV discount on the weekends. Is, that is another analysis point that we're, we'll be looking at. For each one of these scenarios, we're going to look to see what the bonding capacity will be. So based upon that, based upon the bonding capacity, we're going to look as if the Commonwealth is going to issue that debt versus the Hampton Roads uh, Transportation Accountability Commission issuing that debt. Whether there's any value in the Commonwealth or HR TAC, and if there are, if there is any value, understand what the difference between the two uh, bonding entities will be. But also take a look at, in both of those scenarios, what the impact of us securing TIFIA loans may have, just not on the so solely outright of bonding, but also being able to bond with TIFIA included as a loan package. So with that being said, that concludes the, the update for where we are, the cost, as well as the update on the traffic and revenue. Any questions to the commission? <clears throat> Any discussion? Bob, would you? Uh, yes, Mr. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I might be getting ahead of myself, but as I'm listening to this, and I know previous conversations that we've had in this assembly in regards to paying for the HRBT, for example, and those revenues of what those of us who serve in Richmond have been working on, what the appropriate ways of what HRTAP was created, how those money is distributed. 
I'm thinking as I'm looking at it, I'm sure everybody else has read the agreement, uh, the resolution. I appreciate the fact that we've clarified language in regards to how these funds should be managed by HR TAC and that there will be alternative lanes that are in essence free lanes. I'm thinking it, it's worth talking, we've talked about it, that we should include as part of what's being done here and at the appropriate time, maybe, maybe I'm ahead of myself, but I'm thinking we should have a motion. And then what I would suggest is that the entire master tolling agreement for this entire network that's being discussed should be brought before the December 12th meeting and at that time also that that same master tolling agreement for this entire network should have already the pre-approval by the Commonwealth Transportation Board that it's all brought here at the December 12th meeting so that the members here can vote and finalize this agreement between HR TAC and VDOT and that way as it's stated in this resolution it's clearly understood that HR TAC would be responsible for these funds if we move forward and that it's also clarified for the people that we represent their tax dollars understand that we are going to be managing their money where these monies are going to be going and that there's clarity and comfort to the people we represent that there are existing lanes that will continue to be free and that only those HOV lanes, if we move forward, are the ones where these are still are going to be. So that's my discussion as far as what these are. It might be ahead of myself, but I think this is, I think this is, might be the appropriate time to make sure that we're clarifying that what we're going forward with this, that we have an assurance to the people we represent that we are going to respect their money. Thank you, sir. Uh, yes, sir. I just want to clarify something that the delegate said. Whether or not all existing lanes will continue to be free, I don't know if that is the case. And if it is, I, I love that to be the case. Mr. Chairman, in response to that, all existing lanes, we're, we're talking about repurposing the H of B lanes. We're talking about creating new managed lanes in uh, sections that are repurposing of existing general purpose lanes. So I will say that the existing lanes will not be free, but we will provide a free alternative. I see Mr. Donahue indicating that he wants to respond as well. Uh, Mayor Alexander Donahue, Deputy Secretary of Transportation. I want to be one of the that all lanes that are not restricted at any time today will continue to be unrestricted for everyone to use. So when you're in what we call the normal lane or the transportation doors called the general purpose lane, that lane will always remain open and available to all users at all times of the day for their use. That is actually in the code of Virginia. If the state wanted to make changes to that, we would actually have to go back in and mid language these gentlemen approved in 2016. There is approximately, though, a two mile section in Hampton that I did want to note that was included in that law that would potentially be converted for purposes of improving traffic flow only there for alignment. But in, in all other instances, those lanes that are normal lanes that are unrestricted 24 7 would be open to all users, toll free, and no carpool requirements. I think the discussion that the state wants to have with this body, and it should be an informed discussion based on the bonding analysis, is whether or not in the HOV lanes that are converted and in the new lanes that are constructed, whether or not those are managed just during peak periods or whether they're managed on a, a greater type period of time, which could be 24 7 or peak periods and weekends. And I think that should be a discussion where we look, really look at how might that help you build some of these enhancements the commissioners identified other things of that nature. But again, that's ultimately sec something Secretary Valentine said is a, collab a collaborative decision that would be made with this region. Mr. Chairman. I certainly appreciate the Deputy Secretary's comments, but I just simply say that the whole purpose of the creation of this HR tap is to guarantee the people we represent that the money Portion of the money from here would stay here to build these projects. I think part of the reason we're having this conversation is an understanding that, that the people we represent have made it clear to us that the money for these projects from here stay here to build these projects that are necessary for here, and that HR TAC will be in control of those monies, candidly, so that those of us who serve in public office can be held accountable for the decisions we make. That is that is why that law exists. That's why we passed that law to have the accountability of, of the taxpayers' money going to the projects they demand get built or approved by. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, 
the county is good. I, I don't think we have any disagreement here that these revenues are staying in this region and that we will be the region and the state are working together to identify where those go through a master plan agreement. So I apologize for my previous remark gave any lack of clarity on that issue, but I want to be direct down the answer, Mr. Chairman. That is the intent. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, uh, the last uh, question or remark. Uh, as it relates to funding and operation of the Express Lanes Network, the resolution calls for HR tax to manage those funds, but the Commonwealth is issuing debt versus HR tax. This is either, maybe both, but I'm certain that if debt is being issued by the Commonwealth, um, there may be management of the funding and operation by but by uh, the Commonwealth. Go ahead. So again, uh, at the risk of uh, speaking for the Treasury Department, I do believe if the Commonwealth were to be the issuer of the debt, they would need to be the ones who operate those express lanes. In any instance, though, as I stated earlier, I want to be very clear, any actions the Commonwealth takes on any express lanes in this region, we're going to be under the terms of the master tolling agreement, which is in place, will be in place with HR TAC before any tolls are put in place. That agreement may say that HR TAC is the one imposing those tolls and seeking to issue debt and other things on the Commonwealth's interstates, or it could be something that says the Commonwealth is imposing the tolls and issuing the debt under the terms with HR TAC. I think those are some of the issues that we hope to work through in the remaining months here before December. Uh, but ultimately, if the Commonwealth is the one issuing the debt, it, would, it is my understanding that the Commonwealth would be, would be the one who's imposed the toll and is operating the lanes. Lastly, uh, Mr. Chairman, if that is the case, one of the concerns that we have here in Hampton Roads is that once the debt is served, uh, that the revenue indeed comes back to HR Tech or Hampton Roads for uh, projects that we have identified, uh, but for not having the revenue, we have not taken on those projects. If that revenue goes into the coffers of the Commonwealth, um, who or what prevents that revenue from going to other priorities that the may have for other regions? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Nick Donahue again. Um, I can thank you so much for talking. Um, there are several things, Mayor Alexander, that are in place uh, both constitutionally and statutorily, and then also that we seek to memorialize through the Master Polling Agreement. I'll start with the Constitution and then work down from there. So many of you are familiar with the Meeks case that was adjudicated in this region in 2012. That was the lawsuit regarding uh, the Elizabeth River Crossing Tunnel. Under that lawsuit, a toll was determined to be a user fee and not a tax, which then required a three-pronged test with regard to how any monies generated from a user fee could be used. The most important one for the purposes of the discussion this morning is that a user fee must provide benefit to those who are paying the fee. So clearly stated, the way that if the if VDOT were imposing the tolls, I'm just going to use that for the discussion, Mayor Alexander, we would be constitutionally prohibited from taking that money and doing something in Richmond because it would be very difficult, if not impossible, to say there's a benefit to somebody on I-95 or there's a benefit to someone in 64 and Hampton Roads by an improvement to I-95 in Richmond. So we would be in violation of the Constitution if we were to kind of move those revenues out. Mr. Lima might be able to walk the other two points, but I think for purposes of your question, that's the really salient uh, prong of that three-prong test. Statutorily, there's a provision under the code that requires any tolls imposed in a region collected in excess of debt service to go into a regional account within the Commonwealth's toll facilities revolving account to be used only for projects within that region. So in addition to that constitutional protection, there's a statutory protection that's on the books today. It's 33.2, 15, 28, or 27. Um, and then further, again, it's the Secretary's stated intent, and I'm here to restate it today, to execute a master tolling agreement with this region that would be binding on both parties, indicating the waterfall that Mr. Page and Chair Johnson have walked through about how revenues would be used, and they would be come back to priority projects identified by this commission without regard to who is imposing the toll. So, As uh, Senator Cosgrove, and then Mayor Johnson, and then Delegate Dancy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Question for Mr. Donahue. 
Um, if indeed the Commonwealth is the keeper of the tolls and, and their revenue, uh, just as in most instances, will the Commonwealth take a percentage in administration fees? Um, that's normally the case. It, uh, look, it just seems to me as a member of the General Assembly, you really want to keep the tolls here. You really don't want us to get you. That's just my two cents. If you can answer it, then. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Cosgrove, uh, the VDOT would not treat this like the tax department does, where it collects revenue and it takes a little bit off the top. Regardless of who's imposing the tolls, there will be certain collection costs, whether that's done by HR or the VDOT. My understanding is that would be the only quote unquote administrative draw, if you will, on the revenue source. And Mr. Chair, we just need, we need to keep a very close eye on, on that particular issue. With all due respect to the VDOT, it's a great organization, but we want to make sure that every penny that we put into this, from our HR tax standpoint, is put to the best use here. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Judge. I was just going to throw out a couple of suggestions. Number one, I would suggest that we have look at our to our financial advisors and the, the HTAC. I feel pretty strongly that our bonding capacity for HTAC is going to be strong, but I think if we look at the statutory issue, and look at PFM to look, give us advice that that's the first direction we would go in. And then I was going to, if you look at the resolution and if you look at the back side of it, the, the fourth bullet, what we say, funding and operation of the Express Lanes Network to be managed by HTAC, I would suggest that we would say funding, operation, and use of total revenues of the Express Lanes Network to be managed by HTAC, if that would help or clarify at all. Just, just a just an observation. A good point. Let's hold that delicate answer. Well, to that point, Mr. Chair, and I still appreciate the question. And, and Nick, I know we're, we, we've talked about this ad infinitum. We have each other on speed dial. Uh, I think Mayor Alexander really has the, the core issue of concern very well stated. There's an old joke in real estate that a contract is what both parties agree not to sue each other over. <laughs> and I think to Mayor Alexander's credit, there's a lack of clarity as to where this money goes, whose checking account's going to be, and who writes these checks. To Senator Cosgrove's perspective, is there going to be a fee on those checks? So I think when we have that master tolling agreement before us, with legal counsel's review, we have case law that's already been stated, I think we can have clarity. Again, it goes back to the people that we represent, the money that they're paying in taxes to go for these projects. They want to make certain that their hard work is going towards their taxes that are going towards these projects. And I think Mayor Alexander brings up an excellent point. We want to be able to tell the people we represent that your money is in this account managed by us and that that money can be used to bond or that money can be borrowed or lend, beat on, or whatever it has to be, but that there's clarity. It's understood, but there's no confusion so that when we have the agreement before us with CTB approval, we can be able to explain clearly how their money comes in, where their money's going, how it gets spent, what projects are going to be addressed, and that's all of their money, and it doesn't get further away. Thank you. I think it's appropriate that we uh, now take up this uh, resolution that's in draft form that's before you on the letterhead of the TPO. And I'm going to first call on Bob to tell how this came about and then ask Mayor Todd to present the resolution. Yes, thank you, uh, Chairman Rowe. After the last meeting, uh, then uh, HRTPO Chair uh, Shepard uh, approached staff and thought it was appropriate to create a working committee to go through the great amount of information we discussed last month and develop a recommendation that could be considered by this HRTPO board on guiding principles that we could endorse and adopt and we will lay on to the HR TAP board as they proceed with the execution of the master toy uh, if, if we pause a second and think about the relationship and uh, like my colleague Mr. Page I think uh, refers to it very well as the three-legged stool. We have the TPO board that establishes the policy and the priority. The HR TAP board then takes that policy and develops funding strategies around important projects and then enters into the agreement with VDOT to deliver those projects uh, for our region. Uh, 
So the TPO Working Committee, appointed by Chair Shepard, took on several of these issues and discussions and is bringing a recommendation to you today. Before I forward that over to Mayor Tuck to report, I just wanted to share with you who was on that Working Committee. Uh, of course, uh, then Chair uh, Thomas Shepard from York County, uh, Mayor Linda Johnson, uh, Chair of HR TAC, uh, of course from the City of Suffolk, Mayor John Rowe from the City of Portsmouth, Mayor Donnie Tuck, from Hampton, Councilmember Courtney Doyle uh, from the City of Norfolk, um, Mr. Michael Hipple on the Finance Committee but, uh, from James City County on the Finance Committee of HR TAC, um, Mayor McKinley Price, I, I know had a conflict but appointed a staff person to represent. I know Mayor Rick West was on our committee, had, had another meeting, but has been part of the emails and we've been distributing back and forth. Uh, that working committee has brought forward some recommendations today. Um, um, Mayor Rowe, I'd recommend that we refer to um, Mayor Donald Tuck for that. Please, uh, Mayor Tuck. Yeah. Rose had an opportunity to review the uh, recommendation we have here. Yeah, I'll ask the first question. We'll go to. Uh, sure. We've seen that passed by you, Mr. Robin Stiles. So the work committee met and John, you can go ahead and flip through the director. Yeah. All right. The first recommendation is the committee recommends that the region endorse a consistent express lanes network that begins with I-64 exception Avenue and News, proceeds along I-64 through Bowers Field and Chesapeake, continues along I-664 to I-64 and I said the Hampton Coliseum. The committee believes it is important to pursue the concept of a fully connected and consistent network to ensure the future needs of the region to address. Number two, the committee recommends that the Express Lanes Network be a consistent hot two network with one hot lane and one part time hot shoulder lane for practical and necessary. Number three, to minimize impacts to the region's motorists, the committee recommends that wherever practical, practicable, the roadways that make up the express lanes network be restricted to hot operation during peak traffic times and be open to all traffic outside of the restricted period. The board committee recommends that funding and operation of the express lanes network be managed by HR TAC. And five, in consideration of policy recommendations to HR TPO, the committee recommends that HR TAC consider the following items for developing a master tolling group while we prioritize traffic throughput over revenue generation, we develop tolling approaches that mitigate impacts on Hampton Roads residents, including options that maximize revenue collection on weekends. Funding and, well, this is the third one, but funding and operation of the Express Lanes Network be managed by HR TAC. Express Lanes Working Committee recommends that the HR TPO Board take action for these recommendations to the HR TAC for consideration. And then there was one that was added um, under number four, the max side, and that's that uh, funding, operation, and use of toll revenue of the Express Lanes Network be managed by HR TAC, and that came out the recommendation of Mayor Johnson. All right, so that we can uh, get this matter before us, is there a motion to adopt this resolution? I move the resolution. Is there a second? Second. Let, let's get it on the floor. All right. We have a motion to adopt this resolution that's been seconded. It's ready for discussion. Mayor Alexander. Sure. Um, I have the same resolutions, just the resolutions Mayor, you're referring to. That is the one with the uh, change that you'll have is one I just read on the back. Yes. All the four, which is the funding, um, operation, and use. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, under the resolve, we have further resolved uh, in the first book, prioritize traffic throughput <coughs> over revenue generation. Am I reading that right? Mm -hmm. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, it's, it's good to, to prioritize traffic throughput, and I think that's a, that should be a priority. I think that's important, significant. But over revenue generation, 
that could very well create a structural imbalance. I would like to know the revenue generation as well, because we could prioritize and agree and place on VDOT and place on ourselves what our priorities are as it relates to traffic throughput. But we're doing it over revenue. That's a priority over revenue. And I believe in balance, having a structurally balanced um, agreement. And so can someone speak to that? Mayor Alexander, I think exactly what Director Page made, that was brought up in the committee and there, there's a definition to both of those pieces that made that come, why we came to that. So I think that could be more explanation there. Thank you, Mayor Johnson. Thank, thank you, Chair Johnson. And uh, Mayor Alexander, your, your question is very appropriate and I think very pointed to uh, call for a little bit of background on this is that when you do the traffic and revenue study, uh, there are certain assumptions that are made in the modeling by the modelers. One is, is you concentrate on throughput and the other is you concentrate on revenue generation. So the, the driver there in that point was is that we want to make sure that we have to generate revenue in order to provide the congestion relief. That's the challenge and I think what we're going to hear from Commissioner Bridge at the November meeting is what revenues come from which segments moving forward. Uh, the other part is, is that if you want to maximize the greatest amount of uh, revenue, you would just go out and toll everyone. And that's not necessarily what I feel that and that's why the language reads as it is. Maybe we could, if I could have the floor to make a friendly amendment, or just a suggestion to say, prioritize traffic throughput over revenue generation where practicable. Or it's a, you know, certainly there's going to be some analysis and discussion here. There is going to be a balance, I believe, of throughput versus the revenue, sir, as to uh, the decision that needs to be made by the region, and one not made by the modelers that are, that are doing the input data. So I apologize for some, hint, for some confusion on that, but the throughput versus revenue generation is a traffic and revenue term, term of the art uh, when they do the modeling. Uh, okay, guys. Is this resolution time sensitive that it needs to be acted on today? Is there a reason that it's before us today without the analysis? It, it is. It feeds into the tolling agreement. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add, uh, Kevin may have uh, covered it in his response to Mayor Alexander's uh, point. Just to be clear, our, uh, our current long-range financial plans includes tolling uh, as part of our repayment schedule and what we saw earlier from the commissioner was the potential of significant additional uh, improvements to the network which uh, will be also paid for by total revenue bonds. So we would not want to send any uh, signal uh, through our choice of language that we somehow prioritize throughput at a level greater than having meeting our financial responsibilities through our total revenue bonds to pay back the total revenue. Paying back our debt service for the things that are subject has to be at least equal priority to throughput, or we're saying that we're not committed necessarily to doing what's necessary financially to pay back our total revenue bonds. We may offer something and I'm not the genius that Kevin is, but I would think that if our toll rate is so high that people are discouraged from using a hot network, then you don't get the congestion relief that you're seeking. And so I think that what our thinking is in this language is that we want to price it such that we actually get the congestion relief. And what that rate might be, we don't know. But if, in fact, if you look at North Virginia, where you can see just four lanes of traffic sitting, and you see just a few vehicles that are utilizing those hot lanes, I don't think we want that. So I think we're trying to get that balance. But we don't know where that sweet spot is. But I think from our perspective, we'd like to just get the relief, congestion relief, and price it so that that happens. Now, I don't think it's a trade-off. 
But the idea is to try and get that utilization. Otherwise, if you're pricing this because you want to be a financial target, you still may not be the target and you won't get the industry. Uh, uh, just uh, so, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, some clarification. Uh, under three here, uh, we talk about uh, restricted op operations during peak traffic times and will be open to all traffic outside the restricted periods. So, do we have a definition of peak traffic times? Uh, uh, and May I respond? May I respond? Oh, because I had the same concern and I started to write an email based on that. Because if we're looking at six to eight in the morning and four to six in the afternoon, and, and my illustration would have been that uh, at last month's meeting, I was coming over here, it was like nine o'clock in the morning, and traffic was all backed up to the point that I was able to do measuring the shoulder while sitting still. <laughs> so if we confine ourselves to six to eight and four to six, we're not allowing for the other times that traffic backs up without any kind of idea that's going to happen. And if you are allowing traffic in all the lanes outside of whatever peak hours there are, and we haven't defined that, then you're not allowing the opportunity for somebody to get out of that traffic congestion and utilize the hot lanes. So I agree with you that we need to try and determine what that peak period is, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Um, so, and also, I, I guess if we're defining peak uh, period as rush hour, then I think that three is threatening conflict with the back, which would say that we're going to maximize uh, revenue collection on weekends, because we typically don't think of weekends as rush hour. So if there is a definition of peak times, um, I, that clarification, I think, would be helpful to make sure that we're not contradicting ourselves with the resolution. So if I, if I may offer up, um, and of course I think everybody's conversation is right on point on the uh, value of managed lanes is to react to the traffic at periods of time, could be caused by events. Um, in our region, it's not only rush hours, but it's high travel periods for vacationers, etc. Uh, perhaps as the TPO considers forwarding these guiding principles and position statements on the HR TAC, that they ask that the, um, uh, to minimize the impacts of the region's motorists wherever practicable, the revenue is comprised of express lanes network, the industry that the hot, hot operation during periods of high traffic. So, so it allows more flexibility then for the demand and tolling to, to, to manage that situation. Uh, to everybody's point, if we lock yourself into six to eight or four to six or whatever that period might be, uh, probably getting ourselves too, too locked in. So I, I might suggest that that language be uh, during uh, periods of high traffic or excessive traffic or something along those lines. So Bob is recommending that on the second line of uh, item three, change the word peak to high traffic. Mm -hmm. High volume traffic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, one of my concerns is that at this point, what we're trying to do is set a policy for us to move forward and to the state to understand what we want to do. And we're, I think we're laying it out pretty pretty good in here, but the more, the more, you got to be real careful, the more of these things you expand a, a line, you're going to end up with another definition. For, for example, what is the definition of high traffic? I mean, and then you go to, you know, what's peak hour? We say in here on number three, uh, or excuse me, number four, the funding and operations of express lane network be managed by HR TAC. So, we, we recognize the fact that there's a thing called high traffic or peak hours or whatever, okay? But the management <coughs> of the tent is, falls into the HR TAC to set those out. And for the people as, as that has been, uh, it's been pointed out several times with different folks in here that we, we're representing the people of Hampton Roads. Well, 
that policy or that line that comes out of that in the HR, uh, HR PAC management is going to be supported and voted on by the HR PAC, which has those rep representatives. So I'm, the only thing I'm concerned about in here is we keep adding more and more to it. We've got to find a definition for every piece, every piece we have. And I just want us to be cautious about that to manage and operate it. That's what the HR tax is for. Hey, Robert. If I might, um, just, and I'm going to turn this over to um, Mr. Page here in just a minute. For the sake of, of just being comfortable, how about we strike that number one that says prioritize traffic through over revenue generation? Just strike that book completely. And then I think there's something that our attorney has as a, as a kind of a workaround for that. Do we have a bring in on that? Just not you hit any anybody opposed. Oh, one thing I, I know right. when we put that in there, we were putting it in there so that we didn't concentrate on just revenue generation. That we were right. trying to get the traffic flow more than the revenue generation, so we wouldn't become <coughs> the middle of Virginia and concentrate on how much we can get out of the network. And we were we know we have to get X amount of funds out of the network to pay our debt, but we were trying to balance throughput and revenue generation <coughs> with that statement. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Page. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, uh, I yield the floor to Mayor Alexander, well, if it's okay with you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. <coughs> uh, striking the language, yes, I, I would agree with that. But let me offer that we replace it with optimal congestion price. And that gives you the flexibility. Yeah, and maybe you consider that. Uh, if that works. Uh, Madam Chair, Mr. Chairman, uh, to, to the mayor's uh, great point, that's the intended capture purpose of a managed way network. So it's very appropriate to put that in. Thank you. I offer that as the substitute language. Yes, let's get it up on the screen. There's a there's so much of an algorithmic curve that uh, that occurs to to maximize the, uh, the the ride quality and the and convenience of, of the hot network. And I think that's where uh, around the table we've heard uh, today and repeatedly in the past that we want to make sure that we have a reliable network that's being created. So the optimization of that network includes congestion pricing because that is the inversion that occurs. And thank you, Mayor, for making that point. And, uh, I apologize to staff for not obeying it because now I'm going to be thinking the rest of the day as to why did I make that suggestion. So, very good, sir. Thank you. Excuse me. Would the verb be optimized in terms of price? Mm -hmm. Optimal is not a verb. There's no verb in that sentence. <laughs> well, I'm saying there's no verb in that sentence. <laughs> Change it to optimize. Yeah. We good? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, and, and uh, Mr. Chair, before, before you do that, I'm going to uh, email Dr. Fyler. Uh, uh, he is a good uh, wordsmith. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Fyler's got the uh, floor, and then uh, Mr. Port. Uh, I'll put on my wordsmith hat. Uh, uh, no, I, I think. What you would want to say, Mayor, is prioritize optimal congestion pricing. Wasn't <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Um, I'm not the best wordsman, and but, but I want to throw out an idea. We, we we talk about peak and high traffic, 
But you know, in today's world, you know, it's fluid. You know, we don't know when the high traffic's going to be. It could happen at noon. It could happen at four o'clock. It could happen at, at ten o'clock at night when a, a conscience is getting out. May, may I just suggest that we forget about the old paradigm and basically use the new tools we have, predominantly uh, dynamic tolling. And that dynamic tolling assumes that as traffic increases, you also adjust the tolling to encourage people to use it or not. And so that maybe we shouldn't have a time period, but maybe we should uh, always have dynamic tolling in place 24-7 and let it manage the traffic in the periods when there's virtually no traffic, the toll could be zero. And at the times, even at, at uh, you know, at 10 o'clock at night, if traffic is backed up, then the toll could be an appropriate figure. So let's use the, the new technology we have and forget about what we've thought about in the past. We're trying to develop a plan to optimize traffic throughput by using the new tools that we're trying to implement. Sure. Yeah, so to, to that point, I believe once you add this, prioritize the optimal congestion pricing as bullet one, you've just taken care of the peak or non-peak, yeah. right? I mean, that's the whole point here, is that in a non-peak environment, the, the price would be zero. Um, and so you could, in fact, technically be doing it 24 hours a day uh, and just let the, the algorithm figure it out. Thank you. We have. Uh, I think maybe we have one more bullet to work on. Please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, <coughs> members of TPO and HR Tech, let's look at the last bullet, if we may. We have two, two tweaks we need to make to that uh, suggestions. Um, one is a strike in, you have funding, comma, operation, comma. Combat or operation. And then after and, add the use of toll revenue. Okay, I'm going to use toll revenue. Okay, that's it. Okay, now at the very end, we need an add. Uh, directly or indirectly, after HR tag, um, you need to add directly or indirectly through the master tolling agreement. Directly or indirectly. Specifically, new construction projects related to 
fall within HR tax direct management sphere. Uh, things like maintenance of the roadway. Uh, that's one of the things that we ran into with the Coleman Bridge. It was tied into the bonding uh, instrument with respect to the Coleman Bridge. And currently, uh, well, in the past up through recent, uh, those tolls have gone to pay for tolling operations as well as maintenance of the structure. So just thinking about some of the scope creep with respect to the use of the funds, we would want to make sure that the HR TAC maintains its focus and its span of, uh, of influence directly when it comes to the use of these funds. Just some comments from the perspective of uh, another jurisdiction that can do something. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I may, Nick Downey here, I'd like to address some of those comments uh, very directly. Uh, I don't think the Coleman Bridge, uh, was, how that was developed and brought forth, is necessarily analogous to the current situation. In that event, there was no master tolling agreement between either jurisdiction or any regions uh, that, where that bridge is located. In the draft term sheet that we have been working on with HR TAC that I know has been briefed in closed session and as a negotiating party on the Commonwealth side, I am also uh, privy to what I want to say very directly to everyone in this room is we, we this money is going to these projects, the HRPT first and foremost, secondarily to other things that HR TAC identifies. The Commonwealth will be maintaining these new lanes, the pavement and bridges and all those things, as we do all other uh, assets in this region. The key reason I believe a clause of this nature is something that would be beneficial or could be beneficial, and I want to be clear, it does not close the door on direct operation management or control. It merely says that the Commission would like to, and the TPO would like to understand the implications of both of those. When it comes to a financing perspective here, the amount of money that might be able to be borrowed if it's Commonwealth 9 c debt, which would have a coverage ratio of 1.15 potentially, or standalone toll revenue bonds, which has a coverage ratio of two times, that has a very, very large impact on the amount of debt that can be borrowed with the exact same revenue stream. And so as the commissioner has talked about these various enhancements that actually deliver the best traffic throughput during the height of rush hour, there are costs associated with those. We are going to work as hard as we can to drive those costs down over the coming months. But I would just like to say, I, I think it's in this region's best interest to keep the door open to go either way with the understanding that regardless of which way it goes, there will be a master tolling agreement as Secretary Valentine has committed here in person, and I am reaffirming today, that will govern the use of these toll revenues and will ensure the commissions and the region's rights, roles, and responsibilities with regard to how these monies are used. And in that, I anticipate and expect, based on the discussions we had with Mr. Nglima, we have a very thorough attorney, let me assure you of that, um, <laughs> that these revenues won't then kind of leak out to scope creep or other quote-unquote types of purposes that are outside of the things that we have discussed in this forum. I want to stress as much as possible, we want to partner with the region. Partnership means we are working with you and working hand-in-hand. -hand. Thank you, sir. We've had an interesting process to uh, come up with these edits. Everybody comfortable with the edits so we can consider the question, which is the approval of the resolution as edited. I'll call them amendments, I'll call them edits. Ready for the question on the favor of the motion, which is to adopt. Is everybody comfortable? Does it need to be read? I don't see anybody saying yes. All right. Ready for the question. All in favor of the motion. Please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carries. Delegate Yancey, do you have another motion? I do, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. We are at the appropriate moment, Mr. Chair. Remember, that would make a motion that the master tolling agreement for the entire network with the Commonwealth Transportation Board's approval will be brought to the Hampton Roads Transportation Accountability Commission for agreement and finalization between the Hampton Roads Transportation Accountability Commission and the Virginia Department of Transportation at the December 12th meeting. Is there a second? Second. second. A motion. We have a motion on the floor that's been duly seconded. Any discussion on the motion? Well, I have a question. Huh? Are you, they physically have enough time to do this? I think that's that's great. Right. Right. Mr. Chair, I respond to the gentleman by simply saying we need to. Yes. Yeah. 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 
Uh, Mr. Sure. Chair, it is certainly the intent of the administration and we got to work towards that end. I would simply note that I cannot predetermine the vote of the Common Transportation Board. They have been briefed on this. They understand what we're doing. I think they are generally comfortable with what they're saying, but I, I don't want to make commitments that I cannot make. I have not heard any concerns from that board with regard to what we're working on, but ultimately that board uh, is an independently appointed board and ultimately they give us direction just as you all give uh, Mr. Crum and Mr. Page direction. So again, it is certainly a staff's intent and the secretary's intent to work towards that end. Thank you, sir. Bob and then Mayor Alexander. If I may, uh, Mr. Chairman, if the TPO board would approve uh, Delegate Yancey's motion, uh, what we could do then is prepare a letter, a correspondence to be signed by the TPO chair that could go on to the Colorado Transportation Board stating that our board took that action today and stressing the importance, uh, recognizing the Deputy Secretary, you, you have so much you can do in terms of encouraging that that would allow us to make that statement as a region and convey the importance to the CTB. Absolutely, and I, know, I don't think he's able to attend today, but I know our representative from CTB, Mr. Shepard, would, would certainly expand upon that at the next meeting. There we go, Alex uh, Mr. Chairman, speaking to the motion, um, just as the resolution that we just passed was time sensitive, Another uh, Nancy brings up a point that the 2020 general assembly session starts the second Wednesday in January. So having this master total agreement for us in December is indeed time sensitive, and I hope that we work towards that end. Thank you, sir. Good point. Yes, we do. Any further discussion? All in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Bob, this completes the agenda. Do we have any further items? Oh, we do. All right, Tom. Hey, I, I, since we have both the uh, chairman here, um, <clears throat> when the commission comes back, or the guy comes back to us to talk about the um, the cost that you start the refinement, one of the things I uh, mean, this eight gigs the worst case rough order magnitude eight hundred thirty five million dollars. That's that's a hunk of change to get something that's going to generate revenue, right? Um, it's almost, you can get into these self-licking ice cream cone type situations where you build it and it costs you more to maintain it than it's worth. So uh, I would like, to, I would be very interested when you come back with this, with a proposal. You okay? Okay. <laughs> when, you come, when you come back, when you come back with this, what the, we need a, we need a, a rough order of magnitude of how much revenue we're going to generate with that option. So we can do a, we can see, you know, yes or no. And one other thing, I'd like to put a marker down now. I know this is probably half a, half a century away, but how long are we going to do these hot tolls? I mean, what, when's, the, when's the drop dead date on these things? Do they have a sunset clause? I know this, the federal government has a, has a hot lane, to go to, not hot lanes, but HOV forever. But somewhere in here, I would think that we'd run out of projects where we need tolling, you know, and we ought to be able to. Well, we don't even have any tolls yet. <laughs> I know, I just want to get, I want to put that marker in there. Okay. Mr. Chair. I think yes, when the supervisor was Shepherd's point, that's the whole reason why we're having this conversation. And that he brings up an excellent point. Who's going to be in control of these tools? Who's going to be in control of these monies? How are they going to be spent? And what's the guarantee that we can give to the citizens we represent that there will come a time where these tolls will be sunset? And we can at least answer those questions. So I, I want to thank Supervisor Shepherd for bringing that point up. That's exactly the reason why we're having this conversation. Thanks. I'm just going to suggest that we um, look at having another joint meeting in the 21st. Any disagreement with that? November 21st, joint meeting to set that motion. Is that a motion? Is there a second? Second. Any discussion on the motion, which is to have a joint meeting between the TPO and the HR TAC on November 21st? Ready for the question? All oh, Yes, sir. Uh, just a, a note, uh, Senator Mason and I will not be able to make it best for Central Alliance Retreat that way. Do you have a better day? 8.40 after that. <laughs> <laughs>